A reading from the 16th chapter of the Gospel according to St. Matthew. Hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. From that time on, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and undergo great suffering at the hands of the elders and the chief priest and scribes and be killed and on the third day be raised. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him, saying, God forbid it, Lord. This must never happen to you. But Jesus turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me, for you are setting your mind not on divine things, but on human things. Then Jesus told his disciples, If any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it. And those who lose their life for my sake will find it. For what will it profit them if they gain the whole world but forfeit their life? Or what will they give in return for their life? For the Son of Man is to come with his angels in the glory of his Father, and then he will repay everyone for what has been done. Truly I tell you, there are some standing here who will not taste death before they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Just a footnote. Um, in my last congregation, I found it, people found it really helpful to have a printed sermon manuscripts uh, uh, with them and so I, I did that today and, and I, don't, I didn't know how many to print. I may have run out or maybe um, you know maybe there are plenty. Oh, it's a work in progress but I felt like it's good to have a text in front of you. You can follow along. You can see how long you have, we have to go. <laughs> uh, you know, it's always a bad sign when, when somebody's talking and you see them flipping pages and flipping pages and you're like, we're never getting out of here. Um, uh, but, but I like it. I feel like, you know, you can go home and find all the heresy and bring it back to me, uh, highlighted. Um, I can, I'm happy to email them for you. Like I said, we're working on it, but um, follow along and we'll see how it goes. Now, let us pray. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Amen. Poor Peter. I feel like every sermon about Peter is always poor Peter. <laughs> so close and yet so far. Uh, last week, he was teacher's pet. I mean, that's like the ultimate pet. He was given the keys to the kingdom. Uh, the next week he scolded in front of the entire class. If you were following along in your pew Bible or, or you have a, just remember, just go a few verses back before today's reading and Jesus commended Peter for his very astute observation. You are the Messiah. Or in the King James, thou art the Christ. Peter makes a bold Statement, and it earns him a theological gold star. And Jesus promises him the keys to the kingdom of heaven. That's not too bad for a humble fisherman. <laughs> Today we encounter Peter. This is pretty much right where we left off. He's basking in the glow of his recent triumph. And Jesus, the teacher, reveals a significant plot twist. The Messiah, God's anointed one, will suffer humiliation and even death. And Peter can't believe his ears. Maybe Jesus is confused. It's awfully hot out here. Maybe the desert sun has jogged his thinking somehow. Peter has the keys to the kingdom of heaven jingling, jangling in his pocket. He pulls Jesus aside to gently rebuke him. But Peter, not Jesus. Peter is the one to be rebuked. And, and to be honest, I've never really liked Jesus. 
in these verses. It, it, his response rings harsh and stern, not like the gentle Jesus we've grown to love. I can feel, I, I sort of identify with Peter, the one with always liked having the right question in class, the one that, that knew the answer when no one else did, and so I, I feel his cheek stinging with shame and embarrassment. He's testified that Jesus is the Messiah. He has dreamed excitedly of what that dream could look like, only to have it rejected. Well, isn't that the way of faith? At least in my experience, the moment that we think we understand the truth scrambles. It's like an etch-a-sketch. The moment we have a clear picture, it just all gets shaken up. And the instant we believe we have God under control, the Holy Spirit spreads holy mischief. And when we think we know what's best for Jesus, hey, we know, we know what you should do. He sternly shows us the way of the cross. And who could anticipate that his cross becomes ours? I think God is not without some irony here that Peter is the rock upon which the church. Immediately, Peter becomes a symbol of tradition. And often the church's foundation is that of tradition rather than Jesus. That's a big tension, is that the church tends to rely more on tradition than Jesus himself. You know, Thomas Merton, Thomas Merton was a monk, a Trappist monk. Uh, he lived in Kentucky in the 50s and 60s. You'll probably hear me talk a lot about Merton during my pastorate here. Uh, Thomas Merton wrote that the biggest paradox about the church is that she is at the same time essentially traditional and essentially revolutionary. The church is traditional, and revolutionary. Uh, uh, but that's not much as a paradox as it seems because Christian tradition, unlike all the others, is a living and perpetual revolution. Now nothing is more revolutionary than the denial of self. Our society and human nature, really, uh, uh, promotes the self, capital S, self, over others, there are entire industries that support a uh, self-discovery, self-fulfillment, self-enjoyment. And the tradition of the church, though, is rooted in self-denial. Now, let me have a, a quick caveat. I always get twitchy when we talk about self-denial. It's not meaning, you know, I think I just won't have a second piece of cake. That's not the kind of self-denial uh, that we mean. So, uh, Self-denial means that we admit we're not God. I think I'd rather just have cake. <laughs> we admit that we're not God, that our well-being is more important than our neighbors. Jesus reminds his followers that those who save their life will lose it. And there's a sense in which that self-protective impulse, that a life controlled by fear and suffering and death, this is a life it's already lost. Fear of death translate into a kind of fear of life, not constrained and a cautious way of living. That's, that's not really living at all. To lose one's life in following Jesus is a subversive way of the cross. Now, now Thomas Merton goes on to say that the tradition of the church must always be a revolution. Because by its very nature, it denies the values and standards to which human passion is powerfully attached. Uh, to those who love money and pleasure and reputation and power, the tradition, the tradition of the church, that is, says to be poor and go down into the far end of society, take the last place among other humans. Live with those who are despised. Love other humans and serve them instead of making them serve you. Do not fight when they push you around, but pray for those who hurt you. Do not look for pleasure, but turn away from things that satisfy your sense and your mind. And look for God in hunger and thirst and darkness. Through deserts of the spirit in which it seems to be madness to travel. His point is to take upon yourself the burden of the Christ 
cross. That is, take upon Christ's humility and poverty and obedience and renunciation and you will find peace for your souls. Denying the self is denying the standards of the world and instead upholding the standard of the cross. Now like many of you, I've been watching, you know, I watch the news at night. I was watching ABC News this week and brought to tears by the pictures of those brave individuals and some were first responders and some were volunteers with bass boats who denied the self and took up the cross and rescued people stranded by rising flood waters. Or I was thinking about, you know, a few weeks ago, the display of white supremacy in Charlottesville, and I, I thought about all the anti-racism rallies and, and demonstrations that have popped up over the nation. And although the voice of hatred and bigotry can still be heard in our land, louder voices are taking up the cross, preaching a revolutionary gospel and drowning them out. So the other truth about crosses is that you don't have to go far to find one. <laughs> if you're looking for a cross to take up, I liked that picture. That's sort of what being a Christian is like. You don't have to go far. There's plenty of crosses to bear. Crosses are going to find you, especially if you're doing the work of, of God. And any time you engage in a revolutionary act, whether you're advocating for the poor or you're speaking out against racism or, or feeding the hungry, or visiting the sick and those who are homebound. Just these things, among many others. If you do these things, the cross has found you. Now there are blessings bound up in the cross as well. Do you remember earlier the Gospel of Matthew? Jesus begins the Sermon on the Mount saying, Blessed are those who are persecuted, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people revile you and persecute you and other all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Jesus said you are blessed and that you should rejoice and be glad for your reward in heaven is great. It's because the kingdom of God is revolutionary not only because it includes everyone but its foundation is love. To begin with our, our, our service, the choir sang those timeless words from Saints John Paul, George, and Ringo. <laughs> the four Gospels, right? Um, they, didn't, they didn't sing the verse, but, you know, and I'm sure there's lots of you who can, who can say it along with me. But there's nothing you can do that can't be done. There's nothing you can sing that can't be sung. There's nothing you can say, but you can learn how to play the game. It's easy. All you need is love. Now, I'm, I'm, I'm unconvinced that taking up your cross is easy. It's not. But to take up your cross and follow Jesus is the greatest act of love. And love is all you need to enter the kingdom of heaven. Let us pray. At the name of Jesus, every knee will bend, every tongue confess that Christ is Lord to the glory of God. Amen. Yeah.